sweet actress is, Jay Spencer. Done your wild one here on KZSU 90.1 FM. It's 6.30 a.m. in the morning at Stanford campus, up and out of bed, feet on the floor, and mascara in the mozzarella. <laughs> They're there because it's kind of an enjoyable thing to get an education, actually. How magnificent it is just to be alive, to be at a university, to be at a part of a generation which has, if, if a lot of negative things in its world, at least a lot of good things, a lot of things to look forward to, it's a very momentous time of life. Stanford University. 9,000 acres, 11,000 students. Built by Leland Stanford, railroad tycoon, gentleman farmer on his stud farm at Palo Alto, in memory of his father. The climate is mild. Midday temperatures range from 60 degrees in winter to 74 degrees in summer. Average precipitation is 15 and one half inches annually. 35 miles north to San Francisco on Freeway 101. 15 miles to the Pacific, Los Angeles 400. And so a private university was built, residential in the main and somewhat co-educational. There is one female student to every four males. 5,361 students own and operate automobiles, of whose number 3,552 of these automobiles are owned by students who don't live at Stanford but near enough to drive to school. The architecture is commonly thought to be Spanish mission, although it is in fact Richardson Romanesque. It has a certain dignity to it. Richness in teaching, richness in courses under these roofs. In general, only candidates who are qualified in aptitude and motivation. Prospective candidates should write to the Office of Admissions. 180 units are necessary. See thesis requirements. For information on courses offered, consult the handbook. Consult the handbook. Spring quarter, seminar on Middle English literature, four units, Mondays and Wednesdays, 215. Comparative parasitology and protozoa, four units, winter, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 8 a.m. till 10. Intensive Chinese, 15 units, summer, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 8 till 12. Advanced computer programming, the devising of languages for the communication between men and digital computers, three units. Elementary Polish, elementary Russian, advanced Russian, diachrony and synchrony of the Western Slavic. I think my first impressions were of wealth and the good life. Fast cars zipping around campus with cargoes of honey blondes. But later, you realize that people take their studies very seriously here. Well, I've got three eight o'clocks this quarter, which means that I leave the fraternity house at maybe five or six minutes to eight. It takes me about that long to get on quad without pushing it. I, I cut classes occasionally, but you've got to get your money's worth, you know. Fees are four seventy a quarter, fourteen hundred a year. Works out at about eleven dollars a day. It actually doesn't cost me this much because I've got a half tuition scholarship. Still, when you add on living costs, it's an expensive school. I think it pays off if you work. It's up to you. And of course it's true, there's a certain level of work that has to be done because, I mean, if you don't, you're ashamed, right? <laughs> you can't be last. I uh, once heard of a lecturer at Oxford who tried to give a class at 8 o'clock in the morning. He had, um, I think it was three people the first week, two the second week, and nobody thereafter. And there's so many courses at Stanford. You just, you're in one discipline, and you just want to run around taking all these courses and everything else. I've never been quite tempted to take one in engineering. But my golly, there are so many things in the history department, or you want to go take something about Far Eastern studies, and you've never really ever had anything in that department before. Or what I'd like to take is one about plant design in architecture. And I think it would be really fun. Psychological process. A university is essentially a way of bringing together curious and interested students and learned and dedicated professors. The students here are very bright. The number of 150 IQs wandering around is just fantastic. It puts great demands on you as a teacher. If you don't make sense, if you are not intellectually exciting, they won't come to your classes. They won't read your books. The professors here are young and very in touch with student ideas. There's a nice sort of rapport between students and faculty here. 
and these students compare performances, teaching performances, that is. Sometimes it's almost like having a classroom full of other professors. My teaching is not dogmatic. It's more uh, free-flowing than that. Of course, there are certain facts that have to be got across, but once the groundwork has been laid, we're free to take it from there. And when the students respond, it's very worthwhile. All the classes I've been to have been small, which means you can get some sort of exchange of ideas going between teachers and students. I think we're getting to the stage of valuing teaching as an art, though I suspect that more value will always be placed on publications by some people. Well, after all, it's through published writings that a university gains its reputation, and uh, this, like any other school, has its haste to fame. Come on, pick it up. Come on, let's go. Come on, pick it up. Yeah. Okay, I don't even know you're we are placing increasing emphasis on teaching, and I think our present faculty shows this. The professors are Most good, and the students find at least appreciate. one faculty member who really turns them on. You know, a guy you latch on to. Of course, there's an opportunism in this, as well as an enthusiasm. The better you know your professor, the better you know what he wants to hear on his tests. You're being tested all the time, and every 11 weeks come the final exams. It, it tends to, to mean that every student has much more pressure on him. Yeah. And I suppose this means he works harder. To, to, uh, to a good result, do you think? I don't think it necessarily means that he works uh, more intelligently. In fact, I think the courses are much shorter. Mm. If you're only working on a short-term basis for, shall we say, nine or ten weeks, as yeah. opposed to a year, uh, you can't study anything in its very great depth. And it means that you're learning a lot of facts which uh, you're just stuffing into your head for a short period, and then you'll probably forget them. Indeed. I think people in general work too hard here. Yes, they're having to, having to think about too many subjects at once, having to, to read too many pages in four different subjects per night. Yeah. I think they have to write too many papers. Um, they have to, <laughs> they have to, <coughs> in fact, they have to skip through their work. No. Indeed. Mm. Yeah. And this, this kind of rapid examination means that you, you phase out of, of full areas of mm. knowledge constantly. Yeah. You, you have this satisfying feeling that that's done yeah. and now on to the next. Yes, it's true. You're constantly pushing on to new things here. You're hardly involved in a course before it's over. But I, I don't think this is necessarily Stanford's fault. I mean, once universities were contemplative places built around books and a library, but not anymore. It used to be a wonderful thing to go to the library of a great university. It was the heart of the university. Uh, books were the heart. I have a feeling that students don't have time for the same sense of reverence toward books. They, they use them, they extract the facts, and then turn elsewhere. But there's, there's no reverence. At the beginning of the quarter, a student will walk up to a section, say, Humanities 106. They won't even look at the books. Just take a copy of each book and throw it in their bag. The average student's attitude towards books would be one of utility, I would say. The true source of knowledge these days is in things like our new linear accelerator up on the hill or the computation center. This is where the excellence is, the new source of knowledge. If you want to know something, you go and ask a machine to tell you the answer. And it does, usually. Well, that's the thing, it tells you. So they're right, you see. How are it fixed for hardware? Uh, not too well. We're still having trouble with F drive in regard to density changing on the 1401. I was saying, well, we'll put it on the 7090 then and use it for an output tape. Yeah, that, that should cool it if you, if you play it that way. Yeah, no sweat. OK, anything else? Yeah, um, I, I'm glad I thought of it. I, well, I had it logged. You'll notice that. Uh, when you come up on Balgol and with the compiler has a, a beautiful bug in it, in case we get clobbered completely, you hit uh, IC3 and give it a trot of 50, and that'll kick the job off, and that's all you have to do. Okay, see you tomorrow. Okay.
Last year I had a dream. I was painting out in White Memorial Plaza on a huge easel. People were standing around watching me as I was painting. It was a figure, a figure of a man in black and white, and the painting became a, a human force, had the power to destroy itself. Two days later, I had a long discussion with Boyle, and we linked my dream painting up with the work I was doing in class. Sometimes there is a point when the painting starts to get away from you. It takes on a life of its own, becomes a sort of automatic writing process. You feel that the deepest parts of your personality are coming out on the canvas. It's terrifying. You have to do something, but you don't know what to do. There's this old thing about lack of understanding between scientists and people in the humanities. But I, I think the real disparity is between people in a university and, and people outside the academic realm. People outside think we're just a bunch of eggheads uh, up in the clouds. Uh, at most, they see the university as a knowledge factory. In fact, this place should be where new ideas, perhaps even disturbing ideas, are formulated. Uh, at the Union, for instance. Hot dog? Hot dog, yeah. Give one hot dog or two ones? Huh? One hot dog? Almost anyone knows what makes a good hamburger. The quality of the meat is good, not rancid or fatty. The, the bun is moist. The product is hot and juicy. And of course, there's a substantial portion of it. We sell from 12 to 1600 hamburgers a day of different types. We find that our menus remain constant over the years. Though from time to time, an item may be dropped if it is unpopular or if it's difficult to handle, uh, such as your lamb chop. And over the past years, we've evolved an excellent student force. Some of them, well, all of them have a high intelligence level. And as a matter of fact, we've a student employee who engages in scheduling all the other student employees. And we all have our niche, our class, the, our major, our friends, our peer group, our social yeah, clique we that's, operate that's in. That's just what Marcuse was saying. The whole apparatus begins to make people lose their ability to think independently. And he feels that really the only way man can really start beginning to think independently again is at the younger years in a place like the university. He just sort of sits back and wonders whether or not the university will become the sewing ground. He feels that this is what's beginning. He thinks beginning. it's possible. He doesn't think it's necessarily happening he now. He thinks it's happening. He does. Yes. yes. The um, most important alienation we've got around here is uh, from the girls, you know. Uh, apparently, they, these girls have been reading a lot of Anne Rand books, and um, they're, they're really caught up with this equalitarian, aggressive concept. Turns me off. Uh, you, know, you just can't relax for one minute. You figure she, she should get your throat if you missed your cue for one line. They're all just kind of wandering around. They've all got this thing that they're trying to do. Everyone's going around trying to get these gigs going for themselves and trying to put themselves five years ahead of themselves because they're not there, man. You know, they're not anywhere. They're just sitting around talking about these things. They're sort of alienated. They, they've come to the university. They're cut off first from their family, second from their friends in high school, and they've got to find a new niche to fit into. Yeah. And one of the niches is this civil rights student activist niche they fit into. And as soon as they're there, their independent thought stops and they follow the thought that's going on by others. It's being done by others. This way of thinking, this, this tendency toward peace, toward the quiet part of man's nature, which is actually, I think, what these things are all going towards. I mean, I mean, they want to change the world to make it more to their liking. Yeah, I think most of them just feel that this is the way things ought to be. And so what I'm going to do is act in accordance with the way I see things as they should be. It's pretty hard to get uh, worked up about causes at Stanford. Weather is too nice. Just uh, too much energy. Unity through diversity is the motto of the Beta Chi fraternity. And by diversity, we run the gamut from football players to the scholar, from civil rights worker to the bigot, from the radical to the liberal, from the hardcore drinker to the teetotaler, from the Puritan to the promiscuous. In 1962, we had four Danforth scholars, two Rhodes scholars, two Marshall scholars. We're certainly not an oasis of anti-intellectualism. On Sunday nights, it's sometimes a dress-up dinner at a number of the fraternity houses on campus. 
Here, the brothers are asked to bring their dates, faculty members they might know, teaching assistants they would profit to know, up to one of the dinners prepared by a fraternity cook. Now, a procedure to a meal like this is far more formal than the ordinary sit-down meals are served throughout the week. Naturally, the women are served first, and then the fraternity men with their dates. My house costs me 60 a month plus utilities, plus the money I'm putting into repainting. <laughs> the previous tenants left it looking like a pigsty. It's mostly going to be white with, no oh, sun yellow for the kitchen, I guess. I like it here. I, I find that my view of life is rather different living off campus and commuting. You begin to realize what a specialized little world the university is. No old people, no poor people, no stupid people, not even really even un any ugly people. There you are isolated from everything that is disturbing in the outside world. But not really, because you may be studying India or the sociology of the South or something like that. So you're semi-isolated and people react to this in different ways. <laughs> Some don't give it much thought. Probably pretty glad in a way. But other people I know find university life overprotective. Everything outside the university is in flux, and in a way, one wants to be involved, but what do you join, and how far do you go? Do you go to Mississippi, or do you just say loudly, I'm for civil rights, whenever you get the chance? On other campuses, like Berkeley, students are very active. Here, it's a lot quieter, and, but there is a new spirit of activism, and it seems to be growing. Perhaps we are influenced by Berkeley. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels. And you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Today at Berkeley, the words of free speech leader Mario Savio are coming true. Last night, a thousand students began a sit-in here in Sproul Hall. At 3 a.m., police began hauling the limp trespassers off to jail. These were the bodies in the wheels. Now, 12 hours later, the big teaching machine has come to a halt. Outside the hall, various orators, with word from inside, pass the news on to the crowd. Well, for my generation, civil rights is the big cause. When these people banned civil rights organizations on campus, it was like religious persecution because this civil rights movement is our religion. Well, look, not everybody here is a true believer. There, there are a lot of people who say they're for civil rights, but they don't agree with, with certain kinds of tactics, uh, like the strike. But the really important disagreement between the conservatives and the social activists. The conservatives say students don't have the time to meddle in these affairs. We don't agree with that position. Do you want it? Oh! All right, sir. Stanford seems almost pastoral compared with neighboring Berkeley. But conflicts are springing up these days in the most sedate American colleges. We have our liberal activists and a conservative opposition. The activists usually despise politics, yet they quickly got into the fray last election when Goldwater looked like a real threat. <laughs> You're not going to give me any time? All right. Fine. Well, it'll be about that close. Now, live from Network Election Headquarters at KZSU Radio on the campus of Stanford University. 
This is election coverage for November 3rd, 1964. This is Bob Suffle reporting. Here are the returns with 19% of the vote in. KCSU reported the election impartially. The other news source on campus, the Stanford Daily, gave editorial support to Goldwater, and perhaps a third of the student body agreed with this choice. The Liberals lost their leader when Kennedy was assassinated. They supported Johnson, but mainly as a way of beating Goldwater. This is Kenny Nyland reporting from Senator Goldwater's or the Republican campaign headquarters in San Francisco. About five minutes ago, a large poster with Senator Goldwater's picture was taken down by a young student who had been working on the Goldwater campaign. He said that he was taking it back to the university and was going to hang it out his window with a big sign on it saying, We all lost. Politically, they were beaten. But the conservative view of life as a struggle for personal success is very much alive. Uh, of course, we've been working for Goldwater for four to six years. Uh, we, will, we will continue to work. This will, not, this will hurt us to some extent, perhaps. But uh, this is the first time we've ever had our own candidate anyway, and, and so I don't think it's going to be that big a setback. Uh, frankly, I think we're going to be stronger in the next four to six years, regardless of who wins the election. Uh, most of the students in uh, American universities are there are they're strictly to educate themselves, themselves uh, for themselves, not necessarily like the Latin American student who um, goes into his education more or less feeling his debt to society, feeling that, that he must fulfill a certain amount of something wrong that society expects of him. Uh, the American student goes into it typically only for himself, possibly with the idea of making money later on. Uh, of course you think in terms of money. It's a money society. But I think this generation is less concerned totally with their careers than, say, the students of the 50s. I drove out alone to mail a letter to my girl back at Stanford, uh, which was silly since a freedom worker should never be anywhere in the night in Mississippi. Uh, and I was driving along the road, and four whites pulled me off to the side. Two of them got in the car and said, let's talk about civil rights, nigger lover. They drove me out to, um, I guess I should clarify one thing. A lot of people asked me why I didn't run at the time. And being completely honest, I was so scared to death that I figured it was better to wait and see what would happen than just run at the time and then maybe get either killed or slashed up with straight razors. So they drove me out and pulled me off on a side road. When I got out of the car, one of them said, if you nigger lovers are looking for a fight, we're here to give it to you. And I answered that, uh, well, we're just here to help, at which point one of them hit me. And so I assumed a nonviolent position and then uh, they continued to kick me, and finally three of them held me down while one of them urinated on me. So I, I guess I was unconscious for about a half hour. And then when I finally got back to uh, the Civil Rights Center in Marx, I think it's someone addicted over the whole attitude down there that uh, we tried three or four doctors before we finally uh, got someone who would give us medical assistance. Was there any conflict in your mind about... Uh, I guess something I goes back to what I said earlier. When I assumed the nonviolent position, I really had a lot of conflicts, doubts in my mind, because I had three or four years of boxing experience, and I, re I really felt that I wouldn't be hurt as seriously if I fought back, but it's just contrary to everything the movement believes in. Actually, it's, it's not the real interest of civil rights workers to stress the dangers that they work under, but to get through to the Negroes who live in these shanty towns that they can bring about changes and especially to reach the kids with the idea that when they grow up, they don't have to be cotton pickers necessarily, or they don't have to work as domestics, that perhaps they can aspire higher than this. One of my students was named AJ. He didn't like school. He just loved coming and, and loved the relationships he had with us. And, and it was a very good feeling. Just before I was leaving, we were sitting on the porch, and he said, I would love to go down to my brother's congregation in Yazoo City and talk about, um, and just talk to the, the people in the church. And I asked him what, what he would talk about, and he looked at me with a very disgusted look on his face as if I should know full well what he wanted to talk about. And after a minute, I said, well, do you want to talk about civil rights? And he said, why, sure, Carolyn. Sometimes I think you're crazy in the head not knowing what I want to talk about. I just want to talk, tell all the people how great you all were and, and what a wonderful time it was to have, have you all in the 
in freedom schools and in Mississippi. You know, before you all came to Mississippi, it was white man's land. But now that, that you've come, it's beginning to be human land. When you're, when you're in the library, reading in the works of men like Rousseau and John Stuart Mill, you begin to wonder about uh, the great discrepancy between what is and what ought to be or what can be. I think that the university can be uh, a true source of knowledge, but that this knowledge is not to remain only in the university. I think that it has to be applied in society. I think that what we learn here has relevance only if we apply it. <laughs>